A Musical Life with Emmy Award-winning composer Gary Leonelli. Film and television composer Gary Leonelli created the music for ESPN's critically acclaimed five-part miniseries, O.J., Made in America, directed by Ezra Edelman. In addition, he's provided music for Rory Kennedy's 2015 Academy Award-nominated film, Last Days in Vietnam, and HBO's dramatic series, Luck, starring Dustin Hoffman. Welcome to A Musical Life. I'm Hugh Sung. Most television projects for composers involve providing music for 30 to 60 minutes of showtime. Most movie projects call for music for one and a half to two hours. But what if you were approached to write music for a massive seven and a half hour movie and given only three months to do so? That's what composer Gary Leonelli faced when he was called on to provide music for the massive ESPN miniseries, OJ, Made in America, a project that has the unique distinction of being eligible to win both television Emmy and film Oscar awards. Gary, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. Thanks so much, Hugh. I'm happy to be here. Now, I understand that OJ... Made in America is a new ESPN documentary that's receiving a lot of acclaim and rave reviews for your musical score. Now, I understand that you've composed music for several films and TV series like the 2015 Academy Award-nominated film Last Days in Vietnam and HBO's dramatic series Luck with Dustin Hoffman. But I understand that some folks think that O.J. Made in America could be the first TV show to win an Oscar award, which is, of course, the award that in the United States is typically awarded for movies, not television shows. In fact, this seven-and-a-half-hour series has actually been shown in its entirety in movie theaters as opposed to in in conjunction with the five-part viewing on, on TV. I'm wondering, this is a massive project. Did you approach scoring for this film or TV series as a TV show, or did you approach it as scoring for a movie? Well, funny you should ask that, because when I got hired for the job, one of the first things the director told me is that he wanted me to approach this as if it were one big film and not to look at it as five separate episodes as a t- or you know as a TV series. He wanted uh, it to be conceptually organized as a, as a film. And I think he wanted me to, to kind of keep that sensibility in mind. So, um, I did, you know, look at it like that. And of course it was a giant film, (laughs) seven and a half hours and it scared the the hell out of me, uh, uh, because I never worked on a project that long before. Uh, I mean, I worked on TV series and things like that, but, there were always breaks, you know, you get to, you know, write for a week and take five days off or three days off. And, and this was just solid writing for five and a half months, oh seven my days goodness. a week, oh my 15 goodness. hours a day. Yeah. <gasps> wow. So you were really sequestered in your room. How many, was that what, 16 hours a day? Did you say? No, about 14 or 15 hours a day, oh seven goodness. days a week. I took one small vacation, uh, in, near the beginning. And that was it. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was really, uh, uh, a claustrophobic time for sure, but it was such a great project to work on that, you know, it made up for the fact that, you know, I didn't have a life. For six months. <laughs> <laughs> that is incredible. Were you brought on early in the project or did they finish, you know, a, a large segment or even, cause I know for a lot of projects and again, it depends on the project, some movie projects, the, the director will actually finish the whole film and then hire the musician and expect him to get the music written up in like some insane amount of time, like within two weeks or something. Uh, but, or, or 
you know, the rare cases where they bring you on early and they, they work through the conception as they're putting the film together. Which was the situation for you with this? This was actually, uh, I was brought on late and there were a lot of reasons for that. But um, I was, uh, this is the amount of film, the amount of work I would normally do in a year. And when I first was hired, I was told I had three months to do it. Oh my goodness, which you're is, kidding. Which is impossible. So I managed to, you know, just through talking with them and showing them what what's possible to get the deadline extended until actually 10 days before it ended up, it, it was in theaters. Oh my so goodness. It was, we got the, the max that, that we could out of what was there, and which was five and a half months, which was not really enough, but we had to make it be enough. So, oh my goodness, uh, that's incredible! Yeah, can you can yeah. you give us an estimate, approximate within that seven and a half hours of film or TV? How much music did you actually end up producing? Well, I wrote 183 cues. Oh my goodness, <laughs> <laughs> that's terrifying. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that number scares me just hearing it. <sighs> and I think probably about. Five and a half hours of music. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That is that. unbelievable. Maybe... Wow. <laughs> Somewhere like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Well, I, I, I'm going to make sure all my composer friends listen to this. They are, they have no excuses to be late on their deadlines or give me a few minutes short of what they promised. <laughs> the, the good, the good thing is, you know, after I got done with this, you know, I had another film waiting that I had to postpone, and. It was only an hour film, and it seemed like a TV commercial. <laughs> <laughs> like, only an hour film? you got to be kidding me. It seemed like nothing, you know? Wow. So now my, my whole, uh, my whole se- sense of, 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 of length and, and projects is totally different now, in a good way, you know? Nothing is ever going to be this long again, so, yeah. Ooh, well, well, let's hold our breath. Who knows? <laughs> Would you ever take right, on yeah, another massive right, yeah. eight or 12 hour project? It w- w- I mean, because it's interesting because if you're working on a TV series, I guess, as you mentioned, you do take breaks between episodes, even if there are, what, 12 to 20 episodes in a given season. Um, right. That's spread out over the course of a, of a year. Is that right? Right. I see. Yeah. When I, when I did Luck, you know, well, there, we had alternating composers on that show. So, um, because they had a tight schedule and they didn't want one composer to go crazy doing it. So we had two and, uh, it, uh, you know, I'd do a, a, an episode and I'd have basically a week off before I got the next one. And which wouldn't have happened if I was the only composer. And, uh, but that week off is great just to be able to recharge and, and think about what you want to do. Maybe add a few new instruments to your studio, Things like that, that that I really couldn't do on this project. Oh my goodness! Wow. Yeah. Well, listen, I so. I, I want to dive in to actually listen to some incredible samples from, and we're not going to listen to all five and five and a half hours of music, but we were, right. uh, but you were kind enough to send over some representative samples, and I listened to all of right. them, and they sound really incredible. What's what what struck me was the incredible variety of musical styles mm-hmm. and the sounds and the instrumentation that you mm-hmm. used. For example, let's start with the music that you composed for the main and the end title sequences.
Now, from what I'm hearing, it seems to have a really subtle film noir, jazz trumpet over a minimalist accompanying texture. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I'm going to go back to this trumpet, I think, a little bit. I'm, I'm wondering, what were some of the emotions you were trying to capture at the start of the series or the start of the film, I should say? Well, um, the director wanted me to ultimately play the subtext of the entire film, which is the fact that this is a tragedy, a big tragedy. And to, to sort of paint a, a sort of a lonely introspective picture of that. And he did specifically want trumpet. So he didn't have very many specifics as to instrumentation, but he did mention trumpet and oboe as being the two that he de- definitely wanted in the film. So I had those marching orders right there. And then from there, everything was, was up to me from that point on. Um, but, uh, you know, I was lucky to have uh, Jeff Bennell on trumpet. He's a great player. And, you know, I wrote the melody, but I let him go on, on certain cues. And he came up with some really nice improvisational lines and, and really embellished what I had written in a nice way. He's such a great player. And um, it just kind of took on a life from there. Uh, I, I definitely wanted to um, to just show the overall, like I said, tragedy of the entire situation, which is OJ's life and what he did with it and how it ended up and how he's in prison yeah. and uh, through a lot of different, um, you know, for all the things that he did that that caused his own demise. So, yeah, yeah. I'm wondering, and I, I'm going to maybe touch on some other instrumentation, does the jazz trumpet represent O.J. Simpson as a character, a musical characterization of him? Not so much individually. It's it's kind of um, punctuating um, the audience looking at his life and making a musical comment on that. I see. Looking at it from from a, a third person point of view. Sort of like an outside narrator. It's more than I, I didn't in, intend the trumpet to be him. Oh, interesting. Okay. Exactly, exactly. Well, very interesting. So let's listen to another track. Now, uh, again, I love the variety of instrumentation. So this next track is called Tragedy. So it sounds like you're using a string ensemble that's playing in what we would call a Baroque style. So just to explain it, a modern, quote-unquote, modern orchestra, the string players would use what we call vibrato. Their fingers would shake the strings to mimic a singer's voice. But a Baroque styling, you know, again, some interpretations would use no vibrato, keeping almost a pure, even, non-vibrating sound with each note. Was that intentional? Yes, except it wasn't the first part of that cue wasn't actually done with the string orchestra. Ah, strangely. so are we talking <laughs> virtual instruments here? No, um, actually, as, as a rule, I, I tend to like to play everything in the score live and, and use as few virtual instruments as possible. Oh, that's great. And what that cue is, is I have an instrument called the guitar viol, which is which was invented by um, Jonathan Wilson here in Los Angeles, and it's basically a cross between a cello and a guitar, and it's bowed. Oh and, wow! Yes, so that first part of that cue is that plus 
taking a regular acoustic guitar and playing it with an Ebo, which is an electric um, string simulator yeah. that, that simulates bowed sound. So those two together are what created those, that sound in the beginning. Oh, that is and so cool. And then from there, from there the, the string orchestra comes in and uh, sort of melds right into that. Wow. I'm gonna, so. Everybody's going to be rewinding to re-listen to that. How interesting. <laughs> wow. Because it was kind of this eerie you know, almost otherworldly sound that you had, but what a fascinating, what, this instrument is, what's the name of that instrument again? Uh, guitar viol, G-U-I-T-A-R-V-I-O-L. It reminds me and of uh, uh, the, the, what was known as the arpeggioni. That was a, an instrument. That's exactly right. Ah. That's exactly right. You're, ah. you're right on. <laughs> and, and, it's, and in some ways, uh, viol de gamba. Is, is it? Thing. Is, but, Wow. But more there, Pagione, you're right. Wow, and that's an instrument that's actually being made nowadays? Because it, it was interesting, it was, it was an instrument that was popular in Schubert's time. This is a, a, a kind of a lay, well, anyway, one of the classical, early rom- semi-romantic composer. Um, and it was there was like a very famous piece called the Arpeggioni Sonata, and that's the only piece that most classical musicians know. Is the Arpeggioni mm-hmm. being remade again? Are people playing it now? Well, you know, the, the inventor did make sort of his version of an arpeggio when he first started, but um, his intent really was to, he was a guitar builder mainly, so he approached it from that sensibility first, but he wanted to, to create a bowed guitar, and to do that, you have to bow the fingerboard and make it arch so that, you know, you don't hit just, you know, you don't want to hit more than one string yeah. unless it's intentional. So he developed this instrument which was electric only first and then myself and a bunch of other composers convinced him that you have to do an acoustic version of this thing and he did and uh since then he's he's sold so many to many film composers around los angeles and all over the world it's very he's done really well with it and he's he's a very good builder wow. and it, it gives a sound that's that's neither like a guitar or a cello it's, it's sort of its own thing and uh it sounds very uh Mysterious. Yeah, I'd say that's the right word. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, what's the name of the manufacturer again, if you don't mind, or the, uh, the well, builder? I should it's, say. Uh, the builder is Jonathan Wilson. You could Google Jonathan Wilson and, and uh, guitar view, and you go right to his website. Oh, very cool. I'll see if I can uh, include a link to his uh, to his website yeah. in the show notes. This is so he, so fascinating. He's a great guy. Well, thank you so much for yeah. including his instrument in your wonderful sure. composition. Yeah. So let's let's move along. I, there's a whole bunch of tracks. I can't cover them all, but I, I wanted to just again kind of take a look at another one. Now this next track is called Control. So kind of contra- again, I was going to say contrasting, but yes and no. I thought you know we were we were going to be talking about acoustic, purely acoustic instruments, but it looks like we already dealt. You're getting this acoustic characteristic, but through the use of some creative electronics and electric sounds. But here we really sound. It really sounds very electronic, and it sounds like um, if, from my ears, it sounds like you're banging piano strings with a with a mat with a mallet instead of playing the piano with the keys. You're like reaching in. And hitting the strings themselves with some sort of a mallet, am I correct? Or I'm wondering what sounds you used. Partly, yes. Yeah. So I do have a grand piano in my studio, and I did some prepared piano uh, work on that piece where uh, I'm hitting the strings with different instruments and uh, creating different sounds, and then running them through electronics and making them sound kind of otherworldly and and manipulating them in various ways so that they don't sound like the instrument they came from. Um, and in addition to the piano, I again use that guitar viol and a marimba 
a real marimba, you know, vibraphone, real vibraphone, uh, various little um, guitar noises, and all sorts of things. Everything was me playing a real instrument and not from a virtual instrument or uh, anything similar to that. It's all real sort of played and then layered. It's a very time consuming way to construct a cue because there's a lot of trial and error and experimentation and it can take three or four times longer to write a cue like that than just to write with strings, for example. Mm. So um, when I get, and a lot of times I get requests for those types of, the more I do, any one thing, the more I get requested to do more of the same. <laughs> so I've had to do, you know, whole films with that type of uh, an approach. And that can take a long time. It's rewarding work because you never know what you're going to come up with. And it can be exciting and original. But yeah, it's a lot of work. So Well, you know, we, we talked about some of the technical aspects. I'm wondering if you could just maybe comment on what was the emotional directive that you're trying to achieve through the use of all of this, you know, time intensive, laborious, laborious, electronic, amp, you know, distorted instrumentation. What was, what was the emotional impact that you were trying to, to bring out in that particular scene? Well, I can tell you that scene, if I remember correctly, was uh, a letter that was being read um, that Nicole Brown had, had written. And I think in the letter, there were descriptions of, of the horrors that she went through. Oh, and uh, so it was a very dark uh, reading of this letter. Mm -hmm. And the director wanted me to sort of, in, in a way, sort of creep out the viewer with, with these sounds that, that don't make sense and that, that are sort of uh, get underneath your skin and, and make you feel kind of queasy. And that was the, the, you know, the reason we did it like that rather than just with a traditional or orchestra. Yeah, kind of the, the opposite of what we would perhaps label as organic sounds, the inorganic, yeah? Right, right. Wow. But, but, but originating in organic sounds, but turning into inorganic yeah. with electronics. Wow, yeah. wow, fascinating. Well, kind of going, delving a little bit more into this, um, we're gonna, our next track is called Trial. So it starts off with this really sad, mournful-sounding cello. And I know we had, I had asked you in the beginning if the trumpet represented O.J. Simpson, and you, you were saying that you're using instrumentation more as third-party uh, commentators or external narratives. I'm wondering, though, this cello, I mean, to me, it almost sounds like it could represent Nicole Brown or at least her family. I'm wondering, what, 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 were your, what was the emotional intent of that? We, we've gone from... Now, we, we've just had a track which was very inorganic to something that is deeply organic. I'm wondering what you were trying to represent here. Right. Well, that scene, um, there were, uh, on the screen were a lot of scenes that had to do with the riots in Los Angeles. Mm. And, um, you know, some of the Rodney King and the Reginald Denny things and uh, where buildings were being burned and there was all sorts of rioting. And the director didn't want me to play that scene literally. He wanted me to sort of, again, play it from the third person and, and play the subtext of the theme, the tragedy of it all. Mm. And so we came up with, I came up with this sort of tragic cello theme that sort of laces above 
all these horrific images of the city and the juxtaposition of those two elements, the, the visual and the, and the oral, um, with the music, ends up being all that much more tragic. And that's what he was trying to get across. And um, so where that could have worked very well for some of the uh, uh, Nicole scenes. As a matter of fact, there is a cue that you don't, that you haven't heard that is not too dissimilar from that, that does apply to her. So you are right in both regards. Yeah. Mm, so. so it's really comment, commenting on the, the social tragedy, not just of one yeah. person or family, but over an entire city. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Because mm. it's, it, the whole time period, uh, many, many things led up to reasons why the trial ended up the way it did and why the work ended up being what it was. And this film encapsulates all of those elements mm. uh, in, in, into one sort of point. And that's why that particular piece hopefully works in the way it does. Mm. Well, we're going to dive a little darker. The next track to me, it sounds like the most emotionally dark one. It's called, it's titled, I Hope They Shoot the SOB. I think people can figure out what that <laughs> means, but let's listen to this one. So here it seems like all your tragedy, this seems to, for, for me, this was one of the richest tracks in terms mm -hmm. of just organic elements coming together to express something very, very dark. Well, can you talk mm -hmm. about a little bit about the scene and how you use the instrumentation to comment on it? Right. Well, that scene is using the full 40 piece string orchestra mm. that we had. And, um, that title of that cue came from uh, something that helicopter pilot said. Um, he was on screen talking about the Bronco chase. And at one point he said, I just hope they shoot the son of a, you know, uh, he was, you know, chasing the Bronco in a helicopter and the he Bronco had certain meaning this about is OJ Simpson's uh, uh, truck. Exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. And, uh, so the director, again, you know, he's very specific in what he wanted. For, you know, he wanted to make sure that, that I was in sync with his version of the subtext of each scene. And for this scene, again, sort of like the, the previous thing that we just talked about with the cello, um, he wanted to show the, the tragedy and the ridiculousness of this whole thing with sort of a, a very dramatic, big string theme over... OJ driving or being driven all over the city in this sort of like crazy um, melodrama of, of an afternoon and, uh, and why he got there and that he had a gun to his head and all that kind of stuff. So the idea was to create a big scene that sort of had this aching quality to it and um, hopefully achieve that. You know, so that that's the yeah. idea. The word that comes to my mind is operatic. You know, it's, right. this is yeah, what opera is all about. It takes just the most, you know, extreme emotional content. And uh, it sounds like you've applied real life opera to to this music. You know, the, the that's, that's a good way to, I wish I had thought of, of saying that. That's a perfect way to put it. Wow. Wow. You know, it, it's, 
I think what makes this so so poignant is that we're not talking about fiction here. We're not talking about just a creative story. This is real life. You're 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 right. mus- you're making a music commentary on something really awful. This is this is a horrible horrible series of events, you know, and the right. loss of life and and the destruction of a life, you know, the self destruct implosion of a life too. And it's just so powerful right. how you've set your music to to be the third party commentator, but but with such passion. Mm. Yeah, if I had only known 20 years ago when I watched this on television that sometime in the future I'd be writing music to it, mm. wouldn't that have been a, a wild concept? Oh, oh, oh my goodness. Well, yeah. there, I want to go back to uh, another track where you mix in some pretty heavy, dark electronics. Uh, this one is called mm-hmm. Motorcade, and it's probably related to what we were just listening to. You know, uh, there was something said in the movie that for anybody else um, chasing somebody down a freeway, you know, the cops get kind of aggressive and they try their best to either put down a spike strip or do something to run the guy off the road, use the pit maneuver, whatever they can to get this guy to stop. But with OJ, they ended up giving him like a presidential motorcade. <laughs> it was yeah. Yeah. That's really what it was. The cops were all in sort of a procession behind the Bronco at one point during the the whole afternoon. And the director wanted me to sort of hit different frame cuts aggressively with the store to guitars and drums and and really sort of amp up the, the drama of the whole thing. And so... I created all these layered guitars and I think I used the guitar viol again in that to create some sustained uh, sounds. And we just sort of like hard rocked it right through the whole thing. Hmm. Not with a beat so much, but just with these big guitar chords. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And it's interesting because so, it, it really goes through just one central pedal tone. And what we mean by a pedal tone is kind of the bass note that really it's, it that, that kind of, doesn't change. Just this, this kind of this basement note, so to speak, and it just just right. it's relentless. It just stays there while all the other sounds. It almost seems like it's like at the high. That's the road that all these sounds are kind of getting, crashing over or or <laughs> ca- you know cascading over. But this one tone is like the road that all of this chaos, this ordered chaos, is rolling over. Uh, I, it's interesting. I think I was also finding your use of percussion really subtle. You know, you, you, I don't hear mm-hmm. any cymbal crashes. I don't hear any explosives. But your percussion is is, is very relentless, and yet it's subtle. Was that it? it mm. What was your thinking in terms of approaching the percussion that way? It's it's deeply layered, but it's just such a yeah. finesse touch. Well, again, it's all me playing real instruments, real drums, or other sort of bizarre percussion things. And sometimes, you know, I'll process them and, and, and make them an octave lower than they normally would be, and and making them sound deeper and more huge than they might be in real life. So, um, you know, I'd use those techniques, but sometimes, you know, you want to make sure the dialogue is being heard and you don't want to, um, you know, percussion sometimes can, can really step on dialogue mm. if it's high pitched. So a lot of times I like to roll the treble or the high end off the percussion and make it sound sort of muted 
so you can hear what people are saying, but it still has the effect of, of uh, the power that it normally would have, but with sort of more of a muted, um, compressed sound. Um, I hope I'm answering your question, but that's yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. sort of the, the approach I take a lot of times with percussion. Uh -huh. I find that bright percussion sometimes in a dialogue scene that the, 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 the editors will just end up taking it down, taking the volume down too much. <laughs> so yeah. you end up not so, hearing anything. Yeah. You just gave a great right. masterclass to a whole bunch of musicians and composers <laughs> right there on how to score a dialogue scene. That's awesome. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's true. Thank you Use so filters, much. you know, take the high end off. Yeah. 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 So I, I want to close with one last track here. And this one is called appropriately closing. Now, to me, this sounds like two cellos. Maybe you're telling me there's another instrument there, but there are these two lonely, sparse cellos. And the writing in this one reminds me of Mozart's Lacrimosa, which is Latin for weeping. It just it, it's mm -hmm. just such a weeping quality. Can you tell us a little bit about how how you pro? And again, it's it's I found it fascinating that with a title like Closing. You're you don't you're not using the whole full 40, 44 piece string orchestra, but you've got these just two instruments, these two cellos. So tell me a little bit about the thought process and what you're trying to convey. It almost it's it seems almost self evident, but I'd love to hear what your what your thoughts were. Right. Well, you're right. It, it is two cellos, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it uh, it's I keep going back to this same thing about sort of third person commentary on on the subtext of of the overall um premise of what's happening on the screen and for this particular scene it's nothing more than marcia clark you know the attorney making her closing argument mm -hmm. and and but when she's making her closing argument we already know what happened we know that that she she ultimately failed and we know why and uh so the music is sort of punctuating what we already know and showing sort of the tragedy of of of, of her futile attempt at at trying to uh to win her case and you know we could have done it with in a different way that was playing it more literally maybe by playing some tense music that only commented on what she was saying at that particular moment in time, but, but the director didn't want that. He wanted me to play the subtext of what was happening and not what was literally happening on the screen. And so the cellos ended up being, you know, maybe, maybe a little over the top uh, dramatically, but sometimes in these films that it, it's good to sort of go there with that because it's not like we're doing a lot of that the rest of the film so when you do hear it 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 sort of makes this point and it sticks out for the rest of the cues mm. uh, we only have i think a handful of cues in the entire film where there's so the other one you played um with solo cello like that so yeah yeah it, it, it's, so you, that's the idea with that uh, it, it's just so heartbreaking that i mean that's the word that comes when i hear that track it's just heart absolutely heartbreaking mm. almost in its its loneliness just two bare instruments and just weeping over each, you know it's just Beautifully, beautifully written. 
Well, I, uh, thanks. I, well, thank I thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on this incredible collection, and we just touched the bare surface of the enormous amount of music you provided. But I wanted to focus a little bit on you, and would you mind sharing with us where did you get your composition training? And and do you do you play? Um, well, you've just described you do play a lot of instruments. It sounds like you've had a lot of experience with percussion. Are there any other instruments that you specialize with as you were trained to be a composer? Well, my main instrument would, would be guitar, which is why I really was excited about that guitar viol I mentioned mm. before. And I play a little cello, but not well enough to call myself a player. So having the ability to play both those in one instrument was a big deal. Wow. Um, but I play you know, a, little, a little of everything, but mainly only guitar well. I play piano well enough to write and, and to use in my pieces. And... Uh, and then I'll just buy whatever I can buy that's a real instrument and learn to get proficient enough on it so that I can use it. Hmm. And sometimes in unusual ways in the score, just to give it a different color. And a lot of times they are percussion instruments. Like I, I wouldn't call myself a vibraphone player, but I could certainly play it in the type of application that, that's needed for a, a cue for a film. Hmm. Um, so, because you're not going to be playing a Lionel Hampton piece most of the time uh, in a film, unless it's something that's on screen that where you may have to do that. But in general, I'm playing very sparse parts on these instruments, and I, I can sort of um, make my way a- around these instruments in you know, keeping that in mind. Um, and I think the other part of the question was how I got started in, yeah, in this whole thing. Or, well, yeah, yeah, it was, but actually one before that, I was wondering what your actual composition, your musical education, what did that consist of? Oh, uh, well, you know, I don't have a master's in music. I have just a BA. And uh, I ended up, after college, being in a rock band in various, you know, East Coast cities for a number of years. And How in the cool. studio, Doing all sorts of things like that, yeah. Wow. So I don't have the traditional film scoring background, but even through all those years, I, you know, I was, I was always interested in orchestral music and, and sort of the colors that you would get to use if you had these instruments. And, uh, I moved out to, well, I broke up with my girlfriend. She moved moved out to Los Angeles. She had enough of me in my rock band days. (laughs) (laughs) And then I saw her a year later in Boston and she said, you know, you got to come out for a visit. It's a great city. So I did. And I never left. Wow. And we ended up getting married. Oh, and uh, oh, I, wow. I ended up going to, to UCLA for uh, film scoring. Oh. And I learned so much there uh, during the years that I was there. And then after that, I decided that I was going to go for it. I was just going to start trying to get work and, and uh, not do anything else to make money. Just, just this. That's incredible. And... I got a, my first film uh, on a recommendation from uh, a woman in ASCAP, and she had this director that needed a composer. So things started slowly, but and then you know, personal connections are where it's at most of the time. My eye doctor, eye doctor's sister was a producer on a TV show. <laughs> wow! And, <laughs> yeah, and I got that job, and that was uh, a, a series called Monsters, which was like sort of the Tales from the Dark Side people. Yeah. Um, if you remember that show from a long time ago. Uh-huh. So, um, yeah, and then, you know, hopefully you, you try to work really hard and, and you, you you depend on word of mouth to sort of work its magic sometimes and then sometimes not. But, a little, you know, one thing led to, the, to, to another and that's how the whole the whole thing started. That's incredible. Well, how did you get the job to provide the music, the massive amount of music for O.J. Simpson Made in America? Well, it, you know, the, the director, Ezra Edelman, I had worked with before on, on a, a few HBO documentaries. And so uh, we had that, that history. And um, he, he called me on it, you know, and uh, wanted to know if I had the time and interest in, in doing it. And, of course, I, you know, it sounded thrilling, you know, yeah. just to comment on something that hadn't been done too much before. And of course, there was the effects series that just come out. But I think that sort of helped to uh, stir up everybody's interest in the film mm. um, more than anything else. And it was also a very well-produced uh, series. So mm. 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 that's how it started. Amazing. Well, if I, if I might close our interview, if you had any advice for composers or musicians out there that want to do what you're doing, how do they get started? What would you advise them to do when 
you know, the, their pipe dream is to be you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I really think that, um, similar to what I said, you know, how I got my first few jobs, um, you know, if I didn't mention to my eye doctor that I'm a film composer or wanted to be, you know, I never would have got that job. Hmm. And I wasn't really aware at the time that I should be telling a lot of people that because especially people who have nothing to do with music, but you know, more often than not, somebody knows somebody who is in that business and so many things are happen with personal connections. I mean, you're not going to hire a house painter who comes to your door or, and knocks on it and says, I paint houses. You're going to call your friends up or your relatives and say, who do you know that, that did a great job painting your house? Mm. I'd like to get that guy's number. Mm. That's, that's how it works. And that's how it worked for me. Uh, you know, basically word of mouth and connections and whatever you can do to increase the odds for connections and word of mouth um, is what is the only thing you have control over. And then of course there's luck mm. that helps. Mm. But the other thing is no matter how big or small the job is, you really got to bring it and do a great job because you want people to, to like what you did to the point where they are happy to recommend you to somebody else. And even no matter how small the job is, you know, I'd say give it 110% and chances are if you end up writing great music, you're going to go someplace. That's, that's how I view it. Mm. Gary, it's been such a delight chatting with you. And if I ever come out to LA, I would love to meet up with you and just hang out. Yeah, just uh, Even just to watch you work would be such an amazing I would love experience. It. I would thank love you it. so much for taking the time to chat with me on the show. Oh, thank you. And I love your questions. They were so uh, spot on and, and uh, really uh, Aww. Uh, <laughs> thank you. great. Thank you. My pleasure. For links to Gary's website, as well as the website for Jonathan Wilson, the creator of the guitar viol mentioned in the interview, visit amusicallife.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for our newsletter to get the latest updates on future episodes. You can also subscribe to A Musical Life through iTunes or with your favorite podcast playing app and get new episodes automatically downloaded onto your smartphone, tablet, or computer. If you enjoy these stories about making music and the things that move our souls, please tell a friend about this show and consider posting a short review on iTunes at amusicallife.com forward slash review. Thank you for your support. Until next time, I'm Hugh Sung, and I wish you a musical life.